After 37 episodes and almost as many guests, one of them has decided to come back. We must be getting the hang of this now. This is Partners in Crime with Adam Croft and Robert Dawes. Here we are again, Bob. Yes, here we are. Blue skies above us, uh, sunshine on our face. Not actually in the studio, you understand, but uh, I have whacked the Factor 20 on this morning for wow. a little walk in the park, and uh, I'm feeling rather... rather uh, Considering where we are in the year... Uh, We've not had a bad October. year of it, have we? No, we Washington. haven't had a That's bad year. Quite good. I fear when the weather does finally turn, it's going to come as a bigger shock than it normally does mm. for us all. Are we talking about the weather? I think uh, we are. We are. Well, I've got two things I want to talk about. Um, I am currently hugging two books that are very dear to me. He One is, of them... He's actually hugging them in a sort of <laughs> rather loving way. One of them... Have a listen to this, listeners. Doesn't, doesn't, doesn't sound as good as it on the, on the radio as it does in the studio. Um, it, it's a, a signed first edition hardback of Solomon Creed from, mm. uh, from Simon Toyne. I am deeply envious. Which, uh, which I received recently, and which is um, a little link to today's show, actually, because uh, Simon is our first returning guest, if we discount Hugh Fraser and his restaurant reviews. <laughs> no. No, happily, happily, Simon's back to talk he to is. us uh, about his uh, uh, second series of his hugely successful uh, CBS reality TV show written in blood which uh, starts next week so mm. Simon will be here to fill us in about all things written in blood shortly. Yes and the other book that I am cuddling is the one that I finished recently I have here in my hands the very first paperback. Yes do you want me to press. do that? Well, yes you, you can do, do this one. But that one sounds like the wind at Morgan. Um, but it is. What's it called? It's called. It's called the perfect lie. What's the tag? It, the tagline is: What if you were framed for a murder you didn't commit? Mm. That's uh, now available to pre-order and comes out uh, next Friday. I've yet to read it yet, but based on on what I know about your works, uh, that's going to go flying off the shelves. Well, I'm told it's the best one yet. I'm told it's the best one yet. So hopefully, yeah. I uh, yeah, I'd like to think it will fly off of some shelves, or at least one or two. Well, that's my weekend read. Yeah, well, well, I have to say I'm looking forward to it. I've uh, I've not been spending any time reading or watching things, unfortunately, because of uh, being so tied up with that. So I'm going to hand over to you. Oh, thanks very much indeed. <laughs> he says, uh, grasping the baton. Um, moving on. Well, it, it, two very quick things really uh, that caught my eye this week, uh, and one of them is called is uh, the publication of, of course, um, of In a House of Lies, which is the latest uh, John Rebus novel by the magnificent Ian Rankin. Um, and uh, it's got wonderful reviews, uh, as you'd expect. And for lovers of uh, Rebus, uh, it apparently completely delivers. I have yet to read this, but I have it on very good authority from uh, trusted uh, reader friends of mine that it is absolutely terrific. Uh, it says, in a house of lies, everyone has something to hide. A missing private investigator is found locked in a car hidden deep in the woods, where still both for his family and the police is that his body body was in an area that had already been searched. Detective Inspector Siobhan Clark is part of a new inquiry combing through the mistakes of the original case. There were always suspicions over how the investigation was handled, and now, after a decade without answers, it's time for the truth. Every officer involved must be questioned, and it seems everyone on the case has something to hide, and everything to lose. But there is one man who knows where the trail may lead, and that it could be the end of him. John Rebus. Well, there we are. Rebus is back, and uh, and happily so. Um, very good timing, as we've mentioned on the show a couple of times. There is a, a, a touring uh, play uh, on based on uh, one of Ian's uh, uh, novels, which has just uh, opened in Birmingham and is travelling the land. So catch that, catch the book. Mm. And the other one, a bit, little bit of news, is uh, Anne Cleves has published Wildfire, which she has announced is the last of her Shetland series. Uh, uh, she is retiring Jimmy Perry's, uh, which will uh, be bad news for, for lots of her uh, devoted uh, fans. Um, but uh, it's, again, got wonderful reviews. So Wildfire is out there if you uh, love Jimmy Perry's and, of course, like 
uh, Anne Cleves, who doesn't, mm. then get that book uh, on Kobo, maybe, and uh, the new ranking in House of Lies. So that's my little contribution for the week. Yes, we do suggest you get them on Kobo. They are very kindly the sponsors of the Partners in Crime podcast. And as a listener to Partners in Crime, if you get either of those books, Wildfire or In a House of Lies, head over to Kobo.com, find those. And if it's your first purchase from Kobo, um, then they will give you 90% off of your first purchase with them. That's K-O-B-O dot com. I don't think I've ever actually spelled it out before. It's taken me 37 shows. I've just... How do you spell it again? K-O-B-O. Yeah, I think you're I, right. Yeah, I just yeah. had a, a visions, as I was saying it, of people sitting there tapping away going, nope, it's not working, it's not working. God, we really push the envelope on this show. Yeah. We? we really do. And, and Kobo talk- have now just had their first hit to their website from us. Now, <laughs> now that it's taken me 10 months to actually spell the, spell the name out on the show. <laughs> so, I guess we move swiftly now to our wonderful guest uh, returning um, mm. and... Uh, so let's go straight over to Simon Toyn. Many of you who are into your true crime as well as your crime fiction will be fans of the fantastic TV show Written in Blood. The great news is that Written in Blood is back with a brand new series starting this coming Tuesday, 16th of October, on CBS Reality. And the presenter Simon Toyn joins us on the show now. Welcome back to Partners in Crime, Simon. Oh, it's lovely to be back. It feels like I was only here a few days ago. <laughs> well, it wasn't much longer. It wasn't, yeah, it was about a month or so, but there you go. Even so, yes, it's nice to be back. I like what you've done with the place. Thank you very much <laughs> indeed. Yeah, we, we haven't overly decorated the studio, which is a spare bedroom, but it's, it's looking, it's looking it's pretty nice. But Just tone down the pink a little bit. I, I've had enough time to read The Boy, the boy Who Saw, which uh, is... Uh, Have you? Uh, oh, you yes. whistled through them. Oh, well, I said I would, and I did. And uh, I, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Anyway, we'll come back to that in a minute, because I, the, th- the third Solomon Creed, absolutely t- tremendous. I really enjoyed it. But Written in Blood, uh, back next week week um now i have to admit that when i first heard the idea of, of mixing true crime with uh fiction i thought ah oh, now are they going to make happy bedfellows because obviously there's the tragedy the real tragedy of of true uh, crimes and and crime fiction for all its uh, extraordinary uh, research and at times very gruesome uh, um stories is at the end of the day entertainment so when I all those uh, worries, not that they were great ones, went out the window when I saw the very first episode, because uh, it is a very happy marriage, really, of compassion, understanding, expertise, uh, and insight, which uh, written in blood uh, brings to the screen. Where did the original conceit for that show come from? Um, well, it was um, there's a story about how I got involved, but uh, but first of all, I would say I mean all of those things, those concerns that you had in watching it, I had and we had as production company going into it. It was like you know we have to tread very carefully because this is real stuff. You know, real people's lives have been impacted here, and so we were we trod very carefully throughout the series and just made sure that it wasn't sensational at all, and it was dealing with the facts of it. And really the emotional side of it as well, you know, because a lot of true crime series, they all deal with the facts. You know, it's like, oh, this happened. Someone was murdered. This was the investigation. Here's the the sort of the tragic family, the survivor's family, uh, the victim's family, rather. Here's the plucky police. And then there's a monster out there and they're caught and, you know, and justice is done. That's pretty much the narrative. Um, But the way we approach this, and and it's the way we really, um, and this is sort of getting around to the genesis uh, as well, is there was an idea. So I worked, used to work in TV a long time ago before I started writing books. And a producer that I'd worked with um, on the development side, so coming up with new programs, was coming up with ideas, this idea to sort of, you know, how can we look at true crime in a a more emotional, immersive way? Uh, You know, what's the new angle? Because there's loads of true crime stuff because people are fascinated by it. Um, and they had the idea of, you know, you know, could crime fiction, could crime authors, you know, crime writers have a different take on it, sort of, you know, get under the skin of it, so to speak. Um, and so they started developing an idea. And so, and funnily enough, there's a, there's a synergy here because you wasn't your last guest, Linda LaPlante? It, it, Am I right? Definitely. Linda, Linda was uh, our last uh, guest. Least like, yeah, yeah. 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 I want one well, the reason, the reason I am presenting Written in Blood, Series 2 and Series 1, is because Linda LaPlante decided not to do it. No, they, were, they started talking to her. This friend of mine, the producer, was talking to her, and they approached her and said, oh, we've got this idea. And she said, oh, great. And the original idea was that she would present it, 
And she would, um, through all of her body of work, talk about, investigate real crimes or go over uh, sort of true crime cases that had influenced her, you know, stuff that she'd drawn on for her books. And so they were going to do a 10-part series presented by her that was just showing the true crime cases that have influenced her work. Right. And so they pitched that to CBS Reality, who do lots of crime, true crime programs. And they went, oh, that's a really interesting idea. Whereupon, for whatever reason, I don't know the background, um, Linda decided she didn't want to do it anymore or didn't have enough time or whatever it was. So, But then they had this notion of crime writers investigating crimes and you know, sort of telling the emotional story as much as anything. Um, and because this friend of mine knew that I now worked in this world, sort of rang me up and said, oh, we've got this idea. Um, who could present it? Who's another Linda LaPlante type person? Um, and I could have, I talked about it through and I, and, and I sort of got my producer's hat on. And I said, the thing about it is any writer, no matter how long a career they've had and no matter how famous or successful they are, are probably not going to have 10 absolutely amazing stories that have directly influenced their work. They might have the odd one or two, but I said, by the time you get to the mid of the series, you'll be scraping the barrel and it'll be tough. And I said, and also it'd be really hard to get a really busy author to commit to 10, you know, carrying a whole series of 10 hours. And I said, why don't you just have a different guest author each week? Because then you'd get a whole variety of different authors different types of authors telling different types of stories, you know, from psychological thrillers to, uh, you know, serial killer story, you know, all of this sort of stuff. And you'll get these, a, right, a really good raft of amazing storytellers telling a brilliant raft of amazing stories that have directly influenced a book. And they went, and so, so she said, yeah, that's a great idea. So they went and pitched it to CBS Reality and they said, yep, yeah, we love that. That's great, but we still need a presenter. Whereupon my friend came back to me and said, well, you know all these people, because I was suggesting names, you know, the, who made, made up most of the first series, you know, Mark Billingham and Peter James, people I know. Of and course. they said, uh, well, you know them, why don't you do it? And because I came from behind the other side of the camera, I was really reluctant. But also because I came from the other side of the camera, I know how few shows that get developed actually get made. So I said, yeah, fine, I'll do a screen test and see how it goes, <laughs> totally thinking it wasn't going to happen. So I did a screen test and went up to Manchester with a production company and I kind of wandered around the, the canals wearing my long um, coat, which is a kind of French vintage military coat, sort of being all mean and, mean and moody. And they said, yeah, we're great. We really like the coat. Um, so but can he present it? But can he wear the coat? So I think basically I got the job based on my coat. I think the coat <laughs> could have got the job. Um, and, and hilariously, so we filmed this uh, tester in November and it was quite cold. And then the first series we shot last summer and they still wanted me to wear the coat. And it was actually quite warm last summer. Um, so I had to sort of, you know, wear it and then take it off very quickly. Um, this for the second series. Um, so we've shot six more this summer, just gone. Um, it was, as you know, even hotter. Plus, we shot two in America. Um, one in Oregon, uh, one in, yeah, one in Oregon and one in Georgia. Um, and I said, can I just say I'm not wearing the coat? The coat is not coming. I'm not wearing that coat in, you know, 100 degree, 90 percent humidity, <laughs> Georgia. So, that, so, so the coat may have got me the job, but I'm afraid the coat has been pretty much retired for series two. Well, it's very effective, so I, go, have that's, to, that's, I have to say. Very effective well, wardrobe. Yeah, well, no, I get I, the the coat gets more fan mail than I do. I think, <laughs> genuinely. I seem to think I've seen you in a nice pale linen suit in one of the episodes. Uh, yes, so that's, that's that, that was is, your that is put over, Yeah, that's fine. That does come back because that's quite that's fine for you know the southern Georgia weather. I, well, I I I mean it's a it's a it's a so that's the conceit. You've answered both questions brilliantly. Um, and again, getting back to this this idea that I mean, anyone watching, let's take. An example: the, the, the Mark Billingham uh, episode you did w w with Mark uh, about the honour killing of uh, uh, Banaz Mahmood. I mean, you uh, the the journey that the, the tragic journey that the episode takes. It's very it's so sensitively handled by uh, by you and by Mark. And the fact that uh, the original story had such a uh, an impact on Mark that it was uh, very much the starting point for his uh, best-selling novel, Love Like Blood, um, and the particular nature. Of uh, of the tragedy of, of Benaz Mahmoud, um, everyone knows about honor killings um, uh, and uh, and what they are, uh, but not many people under 
understood the uh, the nature of some of these uh, these killings and the fact that it's not just the family it's the uh, surrounding community uh, that act as a network uh, to sort of carry these out um, and Mark I think that was one of the reasons why Mark said I want to take this story because this is something that people don't know uh, and it's mm. tragic and it's it's um, uh, and I want to actually develop that and, and get this this story out there so we have a better understanding did you find there were parallels in other programs that you made where uh, the original true crime story uh, by being transferred to some degree to a novel not only got out to, to many more people but also uh, um, gave information uh, that most people didn't necessarily fully understand does that make sense? The, the, you know, the, like yes, the, yes, yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I think, I think. Um, I mean, Mark's Mark was actually the. So I know Mark pretty well. So I asked him, and he did the. That was the pilot. We shot that sort of before the rest when we were sort of testing out the. Um, oh really? The, the, the yeah. So we shot that first, and we shot a lot more, and then so we cut that down and sort of saw what worked and what didn't. Um, and Mark's just, you know, I mean, the thing is, this, Mark's a brilliant storyteller, but this is the brilliant conceit of the series, really, is they're all brilliant storytellers. They're all best-selling authors. Yes. You know, they're all, they can, if, if you want someone to tell a story, these are the people to tell the stories. You know, it's a joy for me because I just, you know, sit in front of them and ask questions and get these amazing world-class storytellers telling me these amazing true stories. Um, but the, the thing about it is, and I think this was the thing that really appealed to me um, in doing it as well, is um, as a crime, as a writer... You inevitably, you have to think your way into all the characters, not just the victims, not just the good guys, but the bad guys too. You know, you have to, when you are a crime writer, you are the villain and the cop. You are both sides of it. And you have to make these people not pantomime villain cardboard cutouts. You have to think about the motiva you know, the motivation of them and what drove them and how they feel and what they're doing and all this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's a truism uh, that, that, you know, the bad guys don't think they're bad. No. You know, villains don't think they're villains. They might know that they're doing something bad, but they justify it to themselves that they're doing it for a certain reason a lot of the time. You know, yes. there's a logic. And when you're writing, in order to make that your story sing, you have to inhabit that emotionally and intellectually. And so... It, it made sense as well. And actually, when you think about a, an investigation, um, you know, most of the time of these true crime cases, and certainly when we hear about them, um, it's a complete story. Um, and you know the beginning, you middle, and you know the end. And so everything is framed from you have this structure. And so when you look at the facts of the investigation, you go, well, there was a murder. They found this, which led to this, which then led to this, and then they caught them. You know, it's a very clear line you can go through. But when you're doing it in real time, if you find a body, you have all of this information and you have all of this uh, stuff to kind of process as a policeman, you still have, you are doing really what you're doing, the same kind of process you're going through as a writer when they're starting to write a story. Where's this going to go? Where's this piece of information going to go? Um, who did they, you know, you're, in, you're interrogating your characters and your situation in the same way that a, um, a homicide t detective is interrogating um, a crime scene. So there's a lot of there's a real similarity there. There's a real kinship um, emotionally and intelli intellectually between uh, an in a detective and a crime writer. And I think what we do through the series and what we're really careful about doing is is doing that thing is because you as a as a detective you you go into all kinds of areas that never don't necessarily make it into the narrative of, of the, the you know the solving of the case but you still have to go there you still have to think your way through it you still have to discount things yes you still have to sort of you know um almost kind of do a, 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 a simulation in your head of various things that could have happened in the same way as you try out plots you know, as a, as a, I mean, the great, the difference as a writer is you go the most dramatic way, and often in real life, that's not the most dramatic way. You know, the the solving of a case is often, and we found this through both uh, series, is is often down to sort of you know knocking on doors and and plodding and you know grinding police work and just staying sticking at it and finally getting a break. Um, you know, it's often not the most dramatic, you know, CSI uh, neon lit revelation that solves the case. It's just good old fashioned police work. But so I think with all of those things said, it, um, we we very much through this series um, think our way through it. You know, rather than just go and well, this happened and whatever and tragic, you know, and do the headline thing. You know, because most of the time when we know these stories, they're through. Um, they're through news, you know, they're news stories of these um, cases. And news journalism is very 
absolute, you know, and so, certainly tabloid, tabloid journalism, it's all overblown. It's all very melodramatic. You know, it's the tragic family. It's all of this. He's a monster. It's all, you know, it's all very, it's all overblown. So what we tried to do really was kind of think our way down back through these cases and put it on a very personal level, you know, all the way through it. It's like, and that, as you say in that episode with Mark, you know, we sit on the bench and he talks about how it really got under his skin and as a father and, you know, how could you do that? You know, how could you as a father effectively take out a contract on your own daughter and then, you know, get all your family as well to join in and not only do it, then cover it up, you know, this conspiracy of silence. And that's the thing. It's, you know, these are horrific things to contemplate. But as an author, you have to sort of go there. And I think, you know, as a as a as a reader or as a as someone who likes a consumer of these kind of stories in whatever form, whether it's entertainment, whether it's in news, um, we are fascinated by why, why, by monsters. You know, it goes back to um, you know the, the fairy stories. You know, we are we fear these things, and we fear them because you know all of our human emotions are fairly. You can boil them down to two things: love and hate, um, or love and fear. Um, uh, and 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 actually, so these things are. You know, they, they're hardwired into our lizard brain. You know, we are scared of the dark and we are scared of what might lurk in it. And so by investigating these, you know, often quite horrific and exotic crimes in this case, in this series, um, we explore that, but we explore it very much from the inside out, you know, rather than, a, rather than an overview, we really get under the skin of it and really think our way through it. Um, and I think that's, you know, so even so in series one, we did some quite well-known cases like um, uh, the Rachel McKell murder and the Moores murderers and people, things like that. But, but we, you know, it felt like we were looking at it in a different way. We were sort of investigating it afresh and really thinking our way through it emotionally as much as just giving the detail, you know, rehashing the details. Well, I can't wait for Series 2, Simon. Um, are you able to give us a little sneak peek as to who will be coming up on Series 2? Uh, I can tell you, every, so with these six new episodes, so Series 1 was 10 um, and Series 2 was 6, um, and uh, there's two in America. The American authors are Karen Slaughter in Georgia, um, telling the story of the Casanova killer, uh, who was a spree killer in the 80s, uh, which is an amazing story. And he kind of went all over the States uh, and it, 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 on a mad sort of desperate killing spree, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, Tess Garretson uh, is, we did a story up in the Northwest, which is, which is kind of the homeland. It's, there's more serial killers per capita in the Northwest of America than anywhere else, I wow. discovered. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also the 80s, 70s and 80s were the boom time for serial killers as well because it was, you know, it was it was pre-internet and pre-forensics, uh, pre-DNA and all that kind of stuff, so they could get away with it. It's really hard to be a serial killer these days because they're on you pretty quick. Um, so that's a really good story about a, a whole a dynasty of serial killers, uh, which in, uh, which informed one of her books. Um, I'm trying to remember which book it was now. Um, and then we've got Claire McIntosh um, telling an amazing story um, set in Northern Ireland. Sophie Hanna does an amazing story set uh, around Nottingham. Um, Mason Cross has got a really good one uh, based in Glasgow because he's from Glasgow and he remembers it all happening because this double murder of these two women um, in this very small area um, called Campus Lang in um, uh, Glasgow where he grew up. So he remembers it. So, it's, you know, he has a real kind of uh, strong connection to all that and similarly peter robinson you know um writer of the the um Banks, PCI Banks yeah. books um he um his story is in the mid 60s about the disappearance of a girl who uh and it was unsolved for almost three decades uh, and again that was some you know sort of like the area where he grew up um so there's a real connection with a lot of them in mm. this so you know we've got a really good lineup i have to say they're Six really huge amazing names. writers Huge names, exactly. Yeah. All be all bestsellers, all great storytellers, all very different stories, um, and um, and it's really and the, and there's a slight change with series two. So in series one, we we included in the episodes um, a, a few talking heads of experts. So you know the um, so like in the Mark Billingham one, there's the um, lead investigator. She sort of pops up and sort of tells the story, and we have. Um, you know, forensics people popping up and explaining different bits of forensics. And with this, the series two, we changed it slightly. And so what we did with this is it's just me and the author talking. There are, there are no experts coming in because the thing about experts, and we realized in series one is 
they're sort of ubiquitous in all of these kind of shows. You know, you always get the, the you know, and they do, and they're really, and they're good, and they give you stuff. But, but the very nature of their professional job, and the very fact that they're expert witnesses and are required generally to tell these stories on the stand as part of an investigation, it's they're slightly devoid of emotion. And because we were trying to get to the emotional heart of this thing, it sort of, it was, it, it was, it didn't quite work the tone. So we decided that we weren't going to do those. So now, what would the change? And this was pretty scary for me is um, I wasn't told anything about any of these cases until the director said action on the first setup when I met the authors. I knew what? nothing. I, I knew My who goodness. the author was and where I was meeting them. And so I have to figure it out on camera. And I'm given the case file bit by bit as, you know, as, I, as they tell me the next bit of the story and I'm given information, they give me the case file up to that point. So then I'll go off on my own and sort of read through it and try and figure it out. And sometimes I was very pleased with myself and I got quite close. And other times I was less pleased with myself <laughs> and went off on a completely wrong tangent. But the good thing about it is, is I'm putting myself absolutely in the position of the uh, investigators at the time because they, you know, they didn't know where it was going. And so they're looking at all the evidence and, you know, having to try and make um, make a leap and imagine where it might go and, and look for connections and and try and follow the clues. Um, some, but the, sometimes the clues lead you in the wrong way or sometimes you make an assumption which totally wrong foots you and you're missing something small but vital that only becomes clear later on. So, it's, so it really is, you know, the second series is me figuring out. I am going on, a, on I am investigating um, with these amazing writers as my guides. So it was quite, it was exhilarating, but quite, it was quite scary. Well, putting yourself out there on the front line as well. I mean, that's that, that, that that's absolutely brilliant. Now, we've got one final, very important question to ask you, Simon. In the uh, the the brilliant uh, opening titles to Written in Blood, um, you're typing away at a typewriter. Um, do you actually use a typewriter to write your novels? <laughs> No, I don't. I don't write a type. Use a typewriter. Um, anyone who follows me on Facebook, so I put I, I put a picture up very recently uh, of my laptop um, showing all the worn out keys. So the A, the A, the S, the O, the N, and the H are totally worn out. You can't see them. There's just a you know. There's just, so I've, I think I've written three novels on this thing. Um, Mostly using those letters. Strong. You know you can get an app. <laughs> you can get something these days. I I I heard recently where you you program it into your computer. So whenever you hit the the qwerty, it makes a typewriter sound. Um, yes. Uh, yes. It, it, for, for, In fact, um, Tom Tom Hanks, who is a big fan of typewriters and obviously is a writer now, has, has written um, something which is has just been picked for the Richard and Judy thing. Um, he. Um, he loves the sound of typewriters, but obviously likes the convenience of a word presser. So he has invested and brought up this thing. So it's a typewriter, it's a keyboard, like a Bluetooth keyboard, that, but that, had, that makes the sound, that it makes the kind of clacky sound. So you can buy one of these things. I love However, it. However, I do, I, I do have a vintage Olivetti, uh, well, not vintage, but like it's sort of 1970s, one of those carry ones that oh, comes yes. in a case. Um, and when people send me um, letters, if people send me actual letters rather than emails or contact me on Facebook, you know, and it happens time to time, people will generally the older generation uh, who they find my books and they'll they'll sort of send my agent a letter, a handwritten letter or a type letter. I always reply. I will I will type a reply on the typewriter. So I use it for re response. So it's like a, you know, it's sort of, you know, if someone sends you an email, you reply in an email. If someone sends you a handwritten or typed letter, you reply in kind. So that's what I use it for. And it's nice because it has, you know, slightly, uh, the, the T, I think, is slightly offline. So it's it kind of it's slightly higher than the rest. And As they would discover in forensics. Yes, that's character. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 it. It. That would be the thing. So if I did a ransom letter on this thing, I'd be totally banged to write. They'd just find me straight away. Well, we're really looking forward to series two of Written in Blood, we which is available on CBS. CBS Reality, which I think is on Sky and Virgin Media and Freeview, and just about everything except typewriters, I think. Uh, yes, you probably someone's probably working on it, but yes, it's on. The, it's all on the free. It's all. It's all free. Free views, free sat, anything free. Virgin, it's all there. Because so many people say, "Oh, I'd really like to see it," but I don't get CBS Reality, and I'm like, "You, you do. You really do. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to look for it." Well. Um, I, uh, yeah. I suggest that everyone does go out and look for that uh, this this coming Tuesday evening. Simon, thank you so much for joining us again. Yes, uh, brilliant. A, a wonderful, insightful uh, insight into uh, a terrific and unique programme. Uh, so thanks very much, and we're looking forward to the second series, and speak to you soon, Hope, I trust. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for having me back.
While well, that is now set to record on my Skybox, I'm not going to miss a minute of that. I love the first series. I thought it was fantastic. Yes, I mean, it's uh, apart from Simon being, uh, I mean, clearly, uh, as mm. listeners will now know only too well, uh, certainly one of the most eloquent uh, writers uh, and broadcasters uh, on matters uh, crime mm. in, in the world. And uh, such a lovely man, too. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And and he's, he's, his presence in this is pivotal you know it really is i mean he took us through the, the fact that it was basically he took a uh, an idea and expanded that idea and that's how it came to life as as written in blood but uh, for those who haven't seen it he is just superb um very subtle he, he he is a terrific interviewer but because his knowledge is so great as well i mean he's he contributes an awful lot but he mm. does it so so well the program is is produced extremely well um it has uh it does keep me glued it's it's very visual uh, at times it has a, a terrific pace um and is is just a, a terrific show and i can't think of another show like it mm. and we all know that true crime uh, programs and podcasts um, are hugely successful worldwide. This blend, if you like, as I mentioned, I, I didn't know whether it would work. It does. It's superb. Uh, Simon is responsible for most of that, it has to be said, and, of course, his wonderful guests. And if you haven't caught the first series, you know, you're in for a treat. You have Peter James, Alex Marwood, uh, Angela Clark, uh, Luke Delaney, uh, Dom... I call it, it is Dom, but Ellie Griffiths, the wonderful Ellie Griffiths, <laughs> Simon Koenig, uh, Howard Linsky. I mean, they're all on board, as Simon says, uh, bringing the, the reasons why these cases affected them so much, affected them enough for them to put them into their fiction. Um, and uh, that's unique, really, I think. And therefore, Written in Blood, CBS Reality, next Tuesday. Or on catch-up, mm. or on demand, I'm sure. Wherever you are, however you watch, however you listen, <laughs> give it a go. And here comes the BAFTA. Hopefully. So many people to thank. <laughs> Not for us, for no, Simon. No, no, I'm, I'm, happy, to I'm, not, no, I'm happy to stand in for someone and accept it for them. Oh, yeah, no, I'm, I'll be <laughs> totally happy. Um, right, well, I'm... Um I'm done if you're done. Uh, yeah, what's uh, yeah? It's a busy, busy day today. Have you got a busy day? Oh, I've always got a busy day. I've always you... got a busy day. Oh, but I, thought, I almost forgot. Um, if you if you want to get hold of any of Simon's books or any of the books we talked about on the show today, head over to Kobo.com. Spell it out again: K O B O dot com, and they'll give you ninety percent off if it's your first ebook purchase from them. Very nice people. Ninety percent off. That's a great way to start the week, isn't it? Is, it is, yeah. Even though we go out at the end of the week. <laughs> Even though it's Friday. Or whenever you happen to be. I can't get my head around this podcast, of course, because we, we go out on a weekly thing on a Friday. Mm. But, of course, people are listening to it on a Tuesday, people mm. are listening to it the following week on Wednesday. People are listening to it months later. Mm. Of course, we record a couple of days before as well, so it's yeah. not actually Friday today as we speak. Yeah, so you're uh, getting all the tricks of the trade now. <laughs> no, it's not. What day is it, by the way? Um, Tuesday. You see, we don't even know what I have to check on my computer screen, because every time we start an episode, Episode, I have to put myself into the frame of mind that it's Friday. In podcast land, nobody knows what day it is. <laughs> there we are. I think on that we'd better leave. I think so. Cheerio. Partners in Crime was presented by Adam Croft and Robert Dawes and produced by Adam Croft. The theme tune was by the Caesarians. The Partners in Crime logo and imagery were designed by Stuart Bache. Partners in Crime is sponsored by Kobo, your favourite local bookshop, Perfected. Perfected.